Okay, this session is officially being recorded. I trust that you guys are well this evening. Uh, I know this is the first session of the long awaited labor law. Uh, it is because we didn't have um, enough participants. That's why I had said maybe I, I need to address it individually. But uh, Nelly did come up with a solution and she came up with um, a whole lot of people that will be able to attend this session. So that's why today we're going to be starting with study unit one of, um, <clears throat> of labor law. I trust that you guys uh, did go through the study material. Unfortunately, I don't have the textbook with me here. So I'm just going to use my slides and then you can, uh, I use the textbook though to, um, to create the slides. So you can as well go and read from the, from the textbook, uh, use the slides as well to make your own notes without wasting um, any more of your time, we will get right into it. So when we talk about labor law, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, obviously, is uh, work. So uh, labor law is, um, first of all, the first thing that you need to, the slide just reminded me, the first thing that you need to have is the, um, your textbook, obviously, is going to be your number one um, source that you can go, always go to if you need clarity on anything. And then the Labor Relations Act uh, 66 of 1995 is the one that is going to support all the arguments that you see from the website, from the uh, textbook, sorry. If there is anything that you don't understand or any legislation rather, that you feel like you don't understand the Labor Relations Act, 66 of 1995 is the one that is going to uh, clarify things for you. And then any other material will be any CCMA related material. Uh, I got this from uh, Cohen Harper from your, uh, from your um, study guide uh, so that um, it can help you guys is uh, in understanding uh, labor law, labor relations Act 66 of 1995, as well as the material on your textbook as well. So when you have this and you have your textbook, you will be on your way to success. Um, so like I said, your textbook should be your number one source of information and then the legislation as well. And then any other CCMA related material. This is because uh, the Labor Relations Act is the one that uh, regulates workplaces. So all the companies, they, they try to make sure that they abide by the labor, uh, the legislation, which is the Labor Relations Act. So any regulations that are work related, you find them um, on the Labor Relations Act from hiring to firing to the conditions of employment. I know that uh, most, if not all of you are working, so you are already exposed to, to the workplace. And as we go through this, um, through this module, you will start to get uh, like a clear understanding as to how the Labor Relations Act regulates uh, your working environment. So uh, today we will cover the individual and collective labor law, I hope, uh, the contract of employment versus the contract of service. Um, we will uh, also at the end of this session, probably gonna be able to uh, distinguish if a worker is an employee or an independent contractor, because uh, there is a big difference between the two. Um, the origins of the contract of employment, we're not gonna get through to it today. Uh, I will ask you guys to, to read on that uh, by yourself, and then we can talk about it uh, during our next session. I'll try and squeeze us uh, to have another session uh, during this week, uh, and then maybe on, on 
uh, next Saturday as well, so that we can catch up because the other modules we have really pushed and this one because we didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of people. That's why we are only starting with it now. And then uh, the definition of contract of employment together with the origins of the contract of employment. You can read that by yourself. It is on your, on your study guide. I, I think your study guide is not as much detailed. It's on your textbook as well. So you can read on that. If you have any questions, you can always ask me, but we will talk about it in detail in our next session. So when we speaking of labor law, uh, like I said, uh, what what should come to your mind is um, is the working working environment, working conditions. Uh, another thing that will come to your mind is the Department of Labor. A lot of things will come to mind, and then we see this area of law as something um, separated from from law when we look at, okay, there's a department of justice that deals with almost everything, but then we have the department of labor that looks like a different branch. Uh, why is it different? It is not any different to criminal law. It is not different to the law of delict, the law of subsection, the law of persons, family law. It is not any different. It is the same. It is just a specialized legal field that is normally described as, uh, as a dimension of life. We say it's a dimension of life, uh, not a concept, because it is more related to our daily lives. Um, most of our lives we work, obviously. We spend most of our hours at work. So that's why we say it is a dimension of life. It is a part of our lives. So labor law uh, is concerned. Uh, about the world of work and people's engage, uh, engagement in it. So each and every day that you go to work, uh, obviously, or if, if you have started reading, obviously, your, your, your labor law textbook and started making some notes, you will see that there is a lot of uh, a lot of things. Sometimes you probably start noticing, which you know, man, the, maybe my my employer is infringing one of my rights or something like that. But we'll all see it, and it will all become very clear as we go. <clears throat> so, without labor law, I not I believe without labor law, workplaces will not be regulated, and we might be faced with a lot of challenges. And most of those challenges will become very much chaotic. Uh, we know that if workplaces are not regulated, we will be faced with strikes, we will be faced with a lot of protest, we'll be faced with people that are getting underpaid, we'll be faced with, um, <clears throat> with manipulation, uh, it, it, it will be very, very difficult. Like I, I put this image for you to see when people are, maybe they're being manipulated or when they're getting underpaid or if their needs are not met, that is what people always resort to. So, <clears throat> and also to add to that, uh, if we didn't have labor law, we're going to have loss of employment. Uh, the employers will be, hiring and firing people as they please. Uh, employer, uh, the, the work environment will be unsafe. And <clears throat> those are, uh, are some of the problems that uh, we might be faced with if the working environments are not, um, are not legislated. So if you look at um, a normal or a general workplace, or if you've been called to an interview, the employer wouldn't say to you, okay, you can come with your contract and then, um, and then we, can, we can look at your contract and then we can hire you, never. Employers don't do that. It's either the, you go there, they interview you and then they will, um, they will give you the contract. And normally, you just go through the contract just because you are desperate for a job. You just sign on the dotted line and then 
that is it. And then you'll start working without even paying any attention to uh, a lot of important things. So that is where labor law comes in. Uh, while we're speaking on the issue of contract, we all know that uh, if let's say um, you are not yet a lawyer, uh, even if you are, you, you are not yet a lawyer right now, and then you go to an interview and then obviously you get hired and then they give you a contract. And then when you go through that contract, you'll see that they use these big legal terminology that you don't even understand. Sometimes the person that gave you the contract, they don't even understand it themselves because they didn't draft the contract. They had a, a legal practitioner draft that contract for them. And then you just scan through that contract and then you do not understand anything. You just sign on the dotted line, first of all, because you need that job. You don't have any other choice to question it. Secondly, you just sign on that dotted line because you cannot understand anything. Legally, the employer is, is obligated to explain to you what those terms mean so that when you're making your decision, obviously you know that you're probably gonna be uh, maybe staged into a corner. You, you, you really don't have a lot of choices, but they're obligated to explain to you like, okay, this is what we mean by this. This is what we mean by this. Contracts are supposed to be understandable. They're supposed to be in simplified, simplified terms where a lay person is able to, to understand when, when they read it, then they're able to understand, okay, this is what is required of me. This is what I am not supposed to do. My working hours are this, this, and this, and my salary is this, and it's going to be paid on such a date. But if it's very complicated, what most people don't know is that this, when, when, when things go wrong, let's say obviously you infringe one of the rules at work, just because you didn't understand uh, uh, the contracts, you will be able to kind of dispute and be like, look, guys, I didn't understand, or this contract was not in, it was in English, obviously, but it was not in the terms that I understand. That is one of the things that a lot of people don't know that they can dispute, dispute, you find that when something like that happens, you can obviously maybe go for a disciplinary hearing, they can issue you a warning, but you can avoid that. If you knew at the time that you're supposed to ask your employer to explain all those things for you. So that is where uh, labor law comes in. Uh, the traditional function of labor law has to, uh, it, it comes in to address this, uh, imbalance between the between the employer and the employee like i said there is no employer that will allow any employee to come in with their contract because in most cases if not all employers don't usually have the employees interested heart um, as long as it is good for the company it is good for the company it doesn't really matter uh, what is good for the for the employees in in most um, in most working environments? So they will just give you the contract, and then you just sign the contract, and then you get going. And then when things turn bad, that is where they will go and bring that contract and say, "Ah, look, you signed here, and by that time you didn't even know what you signed for. And if you don't have any legal knowledge, you will not have." any idea of what to do from there, you can either allow them to let you go or face uh, just uh, get on with the disciplinary actions that they are imposing on you. So labor law seeks to intervene in the employer and employer relationship in two ways. So the first intervention is in a substantive sense. It is by imposing the minimum standards. So. If you look at the Conditions of Employment Act, it adopts this mechanism by fixing the statutory basic conditions of employment that constitute a term of any contract of employment unless more favorable terms 
are either agreed or imposed by another regulatory measure. So you will see also like when you go to uh, when you go to a lot of workplaces, there's this labor law thingy that is put there. That thing is not just there for display. It is there for people to read. And legally, employers are, sub, are, are obligated, they are required by law to have that poster there so that you can be able to you can be able to read and know what is required of you and when they infringe on one of your rights but a lot of people don't even care about those because they don't have an idea of what of what that thing is there for and then secondly um, the labor law comes in to regulate the national minimum wage most people will say no the, the the national minimum wage is is useless okay it is useless of course because i think it's um i think it's 3500 i don't know if uh, i i i beg to be um to be corrected uh the last time i checked i think it was 3500 or something which is which is nothing which is peanuts which any one of us can do nothing with that if you if you have a family if you have if you have children that go to school you have to pay for your accommodation that uh, national minimum wage is nothing so i would say possibly our government needs to probably work hard and increase that minimum wage so that um, people can be able to improve their living conditions but the truth about the national minimum wage as much as it is very small yes. you will still find that um, you still find that there is employers that try and manipulate their employees to 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 to, to pay them lower than that minimum wage so uh, it protects the employees from manipulation and underpayment so if if we look at uh, uh, companies, obviously they look at uh, they look at somebody's experience, and uh, they look at uh, how many years you have worked, or how skilled you are, or how educated you are. It doesn't necessarily mean that because you are you are less educated than the other, then you should be paid less. Normally, uh, a lot of companies will have something like in-house training where they train you and, and stuff like that. Obviously, some will uh, penalize you if they're going to train you and then they'll uh, pay you uh, a small amount of money until the time that you're more experienced. But the labor law comes in to regulate the national minimum wage, which is at this point, it's ridiculous um, to make sure that people don't get underpaid. I'll give you an example with we have a lot of um, a lot of people from uh, from Lesotho who do um, domestic works uh, and most of those people are usually exploited by their employees because they um, by their employers because sometimes you find that they pay them so little money and they do a lot of work they don't have um they they obviously don't have like working hours to say okay you have to be at work from this time to this time most of those people that are like maybe gardeners or nannies you find that they live where they work they can even work at night maybe they're looking after the children or something like that taking them to school cooking for them helping them with homework etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's where uh labor law comes in and where labor law operates, the they, labor law protects anybody, irregardless of your, of your nationality. Obviously, that's why they, they always require that uh, if you are a foreign national, you need to have um, uh, maybe your work permit or your work visa so that, so that you will be protected because most of those people who most likely go with people who doesn't have any documentation so that they can exploit them. But still, even if they don't have uh, any documentation, they can still approach the Department of Labor for assistance. They can be helped. Obviously, we know that uh, 
our government is very corrupt and then it, the department of labor you will also find corrupt um corrupt um, uh, people that work there that might not uh, take these people's cries into consideration but they are legally and obligated to address the issues that those foreign nationals comes with especially with the issue of exploitation and um, minimum wage so yeah I, I i hope that you guys will understand that and then um the second um the second one is the procedural form of intervention which is to improve the bargaining position of employees by creating rights institutions and structures for example the rights to freedom of association and to bargain employing uh, to bargain collectively and to act as a countervailing force to the uh, employer's economic power. So uh, this uh, talks to the uh, fact that the employees, so you guys will know about um, like the, uh, the trade unions, the ones that, um, the ones that represent, uh, represent employees uh, at their places of work. So the Labor Relations Act allows uh, the employees the right to join any trade unions and also for the trade unions to be representative or to act on behalf of the employees if any problems arise. You will see, um, for example, like with the with the teachers, there is, um, I think there's something called the teachers teachers union, I, I, I don't know the, the term in full, uh, all, 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 all the professions they have, they have something like that. Uh, even the nurses, they do have something like that. And whenever they have any kind of grievances, they, um, they communicate with their union and then the union will uh, try and uh, solve those problems with the employer or with the department involved and we always see it on the news in most cases they will come up with maybe it, it was for uh, a salary increase they'll come up and say okay you guys need 10 percent we're going to give you two percent or something like that and then they will start with the negotiations and then if they are not happy then they'll hit the road uh, for protesting but also as much as the the labor relations act allows the employees the right to uh, to join any trade union to protest or whatever it is how they want to express themselves this is your right as an employee for that uh, particular company you will also find that there is companies that will say if you are a member of a trade union then we cannot hire you or something like that that is exploitation and it is not allowed you are allowed to join any trade union so that if you have any problems, because trade unions have representatives who um, probably um, more equipped in the legal sense to understand those kind of contracts. Some of them are more equipped to understanding the mediation uh, part of, um, of the labor relations where they will be able to talk on your behalf. In, in, in this instance, I am not talking to you guys as legal practitioners, but I'm talking to uh, the people that don't have a sense of understanding. Let's say somebody who is, who is a teacher, for example, who doesn't have any understanding of how they can represent themselves, of how they can be able to conduct themselves at a mediation, um, media, uh, mediation meeting or if even if it comes to a point where where they have to go to court uh, sometimes people don't have uh, enough funds to look for proper representation that is where labor relations uh, labor law comes in it allows you that right to join a trade union that trade union is the one that will be your voice at the time that you are not able to speak for yourself and uh, those trade unions are the ones that protect the people's rights at work that protects people from getting manipulated by their employees, employers. Uh, it's like I've been talking a lot. 
Uh, so if it does happen that it cuts off, then we'll just take a one minute break and come back. So let's 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 think for a second. So I was checking this yesterday as I was preparing this slide. Uh, so in South Africa, we have an unemployment rate of 29%. And then when you look at the current population of South Africa, it's 59.3 million people, which means the number of unemployed people, it's 17 million. 197,000. These are the people that the government knows that these people are unemployed. We also know that with regards to the figures of the population, that might be inaccurate <clears throat> because we have um, people that are undocumented and we have people that are not registered, uh, that, they are not, that they are not unemployed. So tell me, out of 17 million, 197,000 people that are looking for jobs. Some of them have been unemployed for years. Do you think any one of those 17 million people and counting, if they find a job today and the employer will be like, oh, I'll give you um, 5,000 rand a month as long as you just sign on the dotted line. How many people will go through the contract? Because most of these people don't have, they don't have a university degree. Some of them, they don't even have um, a metric certificate. It's a lot of people that are looking for jobs. How likely it is, is it that these people will be able to, to go through the contract that they are given or to, to to ask questions when they are when they are given that contract, it's none. The chances are none because most of them, as long as they don't have um, any other place to turn to, they subject themselves to uh, manipulation and exploitment. Not because they have a choice, but because the the difficulties or the economy is the one that is forcing them to. So uh, I can see that we, we don't have much time. Uh, so when it does cut off, we will come back uh, and finish off this session. I don't know how this thing is popping out. I don't know where I clicked. But uh, is, does anybody has a question uh, before we um, take a short break and come back to finish up this session? Anyone with a question, you can go ahead and unmute or you can send your question in the chat box. Okay, um, <clears throat> if there is no question, uh, we will come back. And then when we come back, we will talk about the employment contract uh, we will talk about the outline of the contract. Um, yeah, we'll talk about uh, what an employment contract is and what needs to be contained uh, in that employment contract, uh, what is included in the employment contract. Uh, we'll talk about the contract of service. And yeah, I think that will be it for the day. But when we come back, we'll talk about the employment contract going forward. Um, I will be back in a minute. <laughs> 